Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. inspired. By, would be great. Yeah, it's inspired by the work of the Long Now Foundation, kind of loosely. Um, so I'll touch on those themes before we get started with the themes of the show. I'm going to pass it to SK, who's going to tell a little bit about P2P, which is this curatorial group. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, so I'm SK. Um, so in 2021, um, the five of us uh, formed Peer to Peer, also known as P2P, and it's a curatorial collective that seeks to ground one another and encourage slower looking within an often dizzying art world. Group meets regularly online to offer feedback and community with a twofold goal of reciprocally strengthening one another's practices and acknowledging the whole personhood of each artist. Um, so a group that formed online and is now just like, um, this is our second physical exhibition. Um, and we're really excited to be working and showing work here with Heaven Gallery in Chicago. I'll share my screen because I should have done that before. <laughs> um, all right, I'm gonna put me over there. So um, yeah, our show is called Gather in, Gathered in the Stretching Now. Um, it's now extended to April 27th, so you have more time <laughs> to go see it. Um, and we've got some cool installation views, courtesy of Heaven Gallery here. Um, and so, like we mentioned, the show is kind of loosely informed by the work of the Long Now Foundation, which was um, co-founded by Brian Eno, uh, which many people might be familiar with. He's an artist and musician. Um, and so the Long Now is, according to them, the recognition that the precise moment you're in grows out of the past and is a seed for the future. The longer your sense of now, the more past and future it includes. So the foundation aims to provide a counterpoint to what it views as today's faster, cheaper mindset and in order to promote a slower, better mode of thinking. And so throughout the show, we were all thinking about time and our own personal ways as it being layered or malleable, um, thinking about time as it relates more socially and structurally, but also in really personal and intimate ways. Um, and so there's a range of work in the show, including large scale installation and paintings, drawings, um, to really intimate small works of um, mixed media materials and, and sculpture. Um, so I think we'll head into the individual presentations now. Um, I'll start us off. Oh, let me <laughs> go full screen. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, my name is Jen Ketchiola. I am based in New York and Connecticut, mostly. Um, and so my work generally considers a kind of multi-layered arrangement of time um, through material play and symbols. I draw notice to membranes, surface tension, and looping as formats for time um, as organized within personal relationships. So these ceramic pieces that are in the show, um, I consider them kind of like portal stars. Um, I got really into apocalyptic and universal collapse theories over these last two years as a way of probably unsuccessfully trying to cope with climate change anxiety. <laughs> um, and so looking at like deep time projection um, and thinking about like this forward focused mindset that, that can sometimes snowball um, in unproductive ways and thinking about visions of the potential future, living always only layers above my experience of the present. Um, and so I often use imagery of like fossilized or frozen or emerging birds as these kinds of ushers or harbingers, um, mostly because of their relationship to dinosaurs, which are kind of like our previous stewards on the planet, um, thinking about this extended sense of lineage, 
Um, also thinking about how birds are kind of the product of dinosaurs making themselves small over time in order to survive um, and what that means for us and our history. Um, and this piece on the right, thinking about um, incorporating blisters and signs of sickness that we recognize from our own bodily dictionary if it were to be applied to dying stars or things of kind of universal magnitude or size. Um, then I have some of these uh, like embryo boxes <laughs> that are um, like layered epoxy with mixed media in between the layers to create images. Um, and here I'm thinking a lot about materials cycling through different lives and objects in the life of the universe. Um, and so these were kind of close re closely related to the apple in a box for infinity theory, which I love. Um, and it's this theory that suggests that if you put an apple sealed in a box um, for billions of years, the particles would eventually go through every iteration possible and end in the original form of an apple. So I was thinking about that kind of like multiplicity of form um, uh, in relation to an embryo, in this case, a chick embryo. Um, these are my weird reference images, like going from these amorphous, really abstract, beautiful veiled forms into this feathered, um, very particular creature. Um, then I have these casted um, like bo uh, boat pieces that have feet in them. <laughs> I'll get to feet more later. <laughs> um, and so these boats um, are me kind of thinking through frozen states that disrupt this material cycle. So acts of mummification, bog bodies, or ice, things being frozen and that process being disrupted. Um, on the underside of this piece to the left on that shelf is a little hole where you can see the foot coming through. Um, really quickly, the paddling feet is a way of talking about moving from one transition to the next in my work, um, thinking about like breaking the water surface tension, which birds have to do when they're going from water into air. Um, and so this is another piece in the show that again, repeats those um, feet that are isolated in these boat shaped ice blocks. Um, this piece is looking at everything from, you know, archaeology to Gothic architecture, um, much more closely related to ideas of time um, throughout history, how we related to time and understood um, anatomy and archaeology through sep even being even through separation from the entity. Um, I'll skip them. Um, and so the back side of this piece then has woodburn drawings. Um, there's uh, kind of incorporating stop motion as a way of um, repeating forms and depicting passing time across a still surface. Um, so there's like eyes undergoing REM sleep, my partner rolling in his sleep, um, our sleep schedules are often um, in out of sync. And so we see each other in this frozen state for much of our lives. Um, and so just thinking about like your personal time zone being separate from another and that friction that happens when we come into each other's orbits. Um, and so then there's this large installation that I have in the space. Um, I here was using the accordion instrument as a way of thinking about fraction, time being fractional um, and something that expands and contracts. It's also sort of bodily. It becomes this worm-like or intestine-like um, form. Um, and, and so uh, 
I won't get into the history of the accordion, but it's also something that's really beautiful that has traversed different cultures and becomes this whole different sound depending on its surroundings. Um, this is what's called a diatonic accordion, which means that the same button will release one note on the intake and a different note on the compression. And so there's this kind of multi-layered um, voice that happens um, that's unique to this instrument. Um, and I'm using different forms like uh, camel and meteor uh, comets as ways of talking about different beings of different speeds. Um, on the right is the paper accordion that I made and photoshopped in order to get this form. Um, I was also looking at, you know, the original um, video, it forms of video art and that being fractionalized and, and turned into a kind of stop motion as well as like Duchamp's new descending staircase, obviously. Um, and then lastly, the feet that are above the installation. Um, I use feet a lot in my work to talk about this transitioning. Um, one thing that I read that really resonated with me from John Berger was his writing on this piece on the right, Lamentation of Christ by Andrea Mantegna, which was one of the first images of foreshortening of the body. And so you're standing at the feet. Um, and John Berger like goes on and on so beautifully about how the feet are the hinge between man and the earth um, or this world. And so once this levitation position is achieved um, and that hinge is broken, that's a way of talking about um, this transitioning from one world to the next. Um, and so it, it kind of recurs throughout my work in different forms, whether that's geese feet or human feet. Um, this is the first time that the feet were overhead, which to me felt a lot more intimate. It feels like um, accompaniment and support of the figure when you're standing underneath it. It also feels like you're under the sheets with this figure. Um, so it creates this intimacy across the distance um, from you standing on the floor up to the ceiling. And so throughout my work, there are um, a lot of recurring symbols that create this kind of index. Um, so feet, blisters, ropes, holes, footprints, all things that together kind of make a sentence that's talking about time being very visceral, being very personal um, and connected to, you know, obviously mourning practices and how we think about time with one another. Um, so let me um, switch over. SK, are you good to take over your slide? Okay, so I'm gonna stop screen sharing and switch over to SK. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So I'm SK Lee. Um, let me just move this far around. Um, let's see. Okay. So yeah, I'm SK Reed. Um, excited to, to share a little bit about my practice and um, I have two um, major like large scale installations in the exhibition at Heaven Gallery. Um, they both combine painting and ceramic practices, but also thinking about the power of installation um, to bring art closer to viewers and um, into the realm of the viewer. So in my work, I think about fluid and sci-fi creatures, and they're often engaging with and learning from non-humans um, who are their companions. Uh, I personally am looking to all the animate species surrounding me for relief from an intensely gendered and capitalist present. And so that's more of my work. Like generally, this piece um, is called Soil Horizons. And that comes from these kind of like soil samples that are taken of the earth. And um, you just take like a layered sample and you get something called a soil horizon. And I think that's a beautiful metaphor for 
thinking about grounding, like envisioning the future that I want to see, but grounding that vision um, in something that's already here, but like taken for granted. Um, and so this piece started actually, um, I had just graduated. So last May I finished my MFA from the University of Kansas. So I'm based in Kansas City. I'm a Midwestern person. Um, but right after finishing my MFA, I traveled to two residencies in New York last summer. Um, one of which was Ice Cream Social, which Jen, who you just heard from, um, was actually the curator and um, invited me to be their first resident. Um, but while I was there, um, New York was re um, really like seeing the impact of the fires in Canada. And so um, the sky was bright orange. Um, I was constantly looking at these um, air quality index screens and like we weren't supposed to go outside and it was like absolutely terrifying. Um, I think about like sci-fi a lot in my work as a way of like envisioning another world where like gender and like beings can behave in ways that aren't necessarily like possible right now in the world that we have. Um, but I also think of it as a way of like um, disconnection um, from reality or from what's important. Um, and so sometimes it feels apocalyptic, but when that sky turned orange like that and I wasn't allowed to go outside, I was thinking about how the apocalypse is here and like, um, <laughs> like it's terrifying. And so I, I often when I'm making these bigger paintings, I'm making really experimental smaller works. Um, and I actually have a collection of smaller like drawings in the gallery if you want to flip through them. Um, but what was coming um, out of that was these like kind of like sun shapes that were like full of anxiety. Um, and that sort of started this painting, the sense of anxiety and um, fear for like what's to come. Um, and so when I start a work, this is the start of that work. I usually start flat on the floor. This is unstretched canvas. It is primed. I start with a lot of water. Um, I'm really trying to embrace like not knowing how to like move forward or like not knowing exactly what the answer is. And so I draw with water and I, I can't really tell exactly what's happening. I have like a vague idea. Um, and then the water likes to do its own thing. And then I drip pigment into it and like things break edges. And so really embracing fluidity of like queerness um, of gender and sexuality, um, breaking the definitions that we think about. Um, and so here's this kind of like painting like building itself and um, that or our green sun was kind of this like built up anxiety of thinking how to like exist here. I continued this painting at Arts Letters and Number Numbers in Avril Park. Um, and that's where I started this goose. So there's this kind of red creature that's wrapping its arm around. And then this goose, which is kind of this black form, and then this wing that's wrapping. And so just like a kind of togethering that it's not just me that's afraid. There are like all of these species that are sharing this planet um, that are equally afraid afraid, equally losing their habitats. Um, and I love the goose as um, a bird that like often establishes a local habitat. A lot of birds migrate um, and go on long journeys, but I'm from um, just outside like Missouri. And so I'm rooted like in a local place. And like, what does it mean to stay? And what does it mean to like be somewhere that maybe is like politically, like not the best place. We have all sorts of like, um, from a political view, it's like a hard place to be sometimes. Um, but what happens when we like start seeing like all the beautiful things here and we like try to make change. Um, so this goose is like wrapping its wing around this person and it becomes kind of like an expansive space. Um, there are two pedestals made out of clay. Um, the, uh, the creatures now embody like a physical space. They um, Painting becomes like a moment of imagination and an envisioning anything feels possible and it feels like a dream space to me. But then the ceramics kind of become a more reality, like how the dreams like are seen in physical space or how other people interpret the bodies. Um, so this kind of like alien form that's seen as like a strange body is now standing, looking at its own image and existing on these like um, local geographies or geologies. Um, so some of my research is like, just paying attention to what's around me. These are bedrock um, uh, that's seen here in Kansas City. And so when you're driving along the highway, you'll see a lot of this. Um, and so one of the pedestals is based on bedrock and then the other pedestal is based on um, harney soil. We're in the grassland region. We have like um, deeper soil, but that's like kind of disappearing um, as like agriculture is changed. Um, native plant species are less and less. 
Um, we do have one of the largest remnant prairies close to here and the soil there is really beautiful. And so um, one of the pedestals is like based on that, but also thinking about um, the time that's in um, soil structures and how beautiful that is. I like to show failure. So in ceramics, a lot can go wrong. I've got about two thirds of the way. This was my original first pedestal. It fell apart and then I had to make a new plan. And um, what actually happened in that failure was like a, something better and just um, really exciting. So I talked about that bedrock that you can see all along the highway. So I actually took this clay that's majority mined in Missouri and I got in my car um, with these slabs and I stopped along the side of the highway and I pressed the clay into the bedrock um, which felt like insanely powerful um, to be bringing this clay like back to this rock. And for me to be outside, like anything that can encourage me to get away from my computer, get outside of the buildings that we're in, like be outside and like engage with these things. Um, and as we were like talking about um, this long now, um, thinking about time, um, rocks are really powerful. There's been so many beings before us. Um, and that is evident and like you see the fossils and you see that time in these rocks. Um, so the second piece that I have in the show is titled Night Grasses. Um, and the, this one was more based on a feeling like um, a body being one with the grasses and um, going in and out of these grasses and the solace that I feel in my body when I'm in these wild places, um, how I feel so much more free than like a lot of my like necessarily like human relationships. Um, I started this piece at Arts, Letters and Numbers when I was working on that goose and the creature painting. Um, you can see there's a ton of water that was happening. Um, and I love just like not knowing what's gonna, what's gonna come of it. And then on the right is kind of how it dried this first layer. Um, I had these two studies of this green and this blue grass and I just love the colors that were happening. It felt like this night time scene that was like really interesting to me. I continued to work on the painting back in Kansas City. Um, they're unstretched because they're portable and that's really important as someone that's financially strained, like all of my work needs to be portable. Um, and so I started building the bodies um, in this space and there's just a lot of dripping that happens, which starts to feel like galaxies or like gives me a greater sense of depth. Um, and starting to ask myself like, where, what's the boundary of the body and what's the boundary of my landscape and my surroundings and how um, they're really all connected. Um, water moves in and out of my body. Um, bacteria share space within my body. Um, my body is like so connected to everything around me, but those connections have been like really neglected in um, capitalism, colonialism, um, in the environment that we live in now. Um, so in this painting, I, I like kind of made the bodies first and then I lost them with the grass forms, just covering them up, which was terrifying. Um, and then I started to like bring them back. Um, and so there's really this sense of them kind of like moving in and out. Um, I use mostly acrylic. I love to use airbrush. So the grass forms on the right, you can see there's some airbrush happening. Um, I made more ceramic forms for these. Again, bringing these paintings into real space and thinking about um, this expansiveness that I feel um, in these spaces that I feel from queerness and in my mind, but then um, the realities of the environments around me and how often this like moment of expansion kind of falls flat. Um, so this is that pedestal in progress. It's just coil, um, one coil by one coil. And that mark is like really beautiful, creates a nice texture. I used a press mold um, to make these grass forms. Um, and like thinking about the grass leaving the painting and coming onto like a physical object. Um, and then again, that mark. So in a painting, when I do a drip, often it expands in the water and becomes about like fluidity. Um, but when I do that same drip on like a ceramic object, it just like falls flat. And that feels a lot of times like my day-to-day -day life. Um, um, and then my last point is I'm super interested in installation. This was my first time to kind of like think about installation in more of a group setting. So um, I don't want you to just like interact with this painting. I want you to think about how it's gonna like change the world and how it's gonna, how it impacts your life as well. And so these beams, um, these beam forms have um, meant to me um, expansion. They've meant to me like 
some sort of internal in energy building inside and expanding out into things around it. Um, and so they leave the painting and they come out into the physical space. Um, and so that's all I have. I could talk to you forever, but I am excited to introduce the next artist, um, Taya. Oh, wait, Taya, you're- Oh, sorry, I'm supposed to present. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> supposed to share your slides, aren't I? It's my bad. Okay, let me share again. Okay, go ahead, Taya. Wait, Taya, you're muted. Sorry. Um, hi, for the first time. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I'm one of the artists um, in the show, and then uh, here's a picture of me in the studio right before the works uh, actually left the studio, and I have been driving them to Jen. Um, in the next two slides, uh, you can see... Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, um, so these are images and uh, details of the paintings I have in the show. Uh, there is another slide that also, also like displays um, what I have in the show. And overall in the presentation, I wanted to uh, speak uh, quickly about um, my studio practice um, over the past year, especially uh, things I have been thinking to prepare for the show and um, some process pictures I would like to share with you. Um, on the next slide, I outline some topics um, and inspirational like imagery uh, that were affecting me um, while I've been thinking about. Um, so they were like, in terms of, in relating to the stretch now uh, concept, I have been thinking a lot about windows and uh, windows being a source of like light and first thing you see in the morning and upon awakening and also um, a connection to that state uh, where um, you are still have uh, like in your dream sometimes, but then your mind wakes up and then you have those thoughts um, about your day and then uh, how you would like to start your day and you're still half dreaming, but then um, sometimes I'm thinking it's a great time to like reflect on re um, emotions and uh, reflect on where you are in life. So that window gazing um, and like looking out of the window and to be in that like sort of in a state of dream um, was always something I was attracted to. And um, I recently had a trip to Abu Dhabi and here you can see on the picture um, uh, a light reflection um, at the mosque of Sheikh Zayed and how the sun reflects and turns into the uh, space and changing the color of the light. And also I have been thinking about windows as a place of observation, a layer, a certain layer between you and uh, outside world and then uh, in a way, a snapshot of of reality. So your window, your view, um, things you're thinking in the morning. Um, recurring uh, motifs is our light, and a light as a big um, component in my memory formation because most of my memories, um, especially happy memories, they are full of light and also like not light as just a source of bright uh, vivid light but also in a way um, um, as a memory light as a color and sometimes like if I think about some moment in the past I return to certain color combinations that kind of stay in my memory so when I um, uh, start painting or think about the state I would like to reflect in the painting I you know I suddenly go back to those color combinations and the feelings I have experienced like the light I have like observed um, of the environment I have been into um, so on the next slide um, I on the next few slides I would like to take you through my some of my um, process uh, imagery uh, so in the 
uh, this work is in the show, it's called Afternoon with Ponds. And on the next slide, I would like to show you uh, how it's all started. The idea of reflecting on the state of being um, inside in a comfortable settings, observing um, your own thoughts and looking out of the window. I just recently came back from Abu Dhabi and the, I probably was filled with this pinkish orange color combinations like going through the memory and also you can see a picture of my uh, our own white um, armchair and as an example like probably of like reflecting on that state I wanted to capture uh, and also have been thinking about you know Matisse and his um, orient trips and how he was um, also kind of like captivated by by different colors and light in, in the countries he had visited during his trip. So second uh, image on this uh, slide is it's, it's just like another evolution of the painting. And um, on the next slide, um, everything <laughs> changes completely. And um, I also have been thinking about tapestries and um, uh, connection of tapestry and interesting um, color relationship um, that are like not really uh, similar to our like three-dimensional world, but at the same time reflect into like traditions and uh, culture, uh, the places you visit. Um, so this is um, just a development of the painting. And uh, I often paint like ghost-like creatures that occupy that dreamlike state fantasies. And so here I am with <laughs> With some inspiration from uh, one of like early artists, I uh, sometimes look at for for just for inspiration. It's, um, I, I'm not sure if I pronounce it right, but uh, it's a Fragonard and uh, a piece of uh, tapestry, just like as an example of um, of maybe like color reflections that can happen in the painting. Um, and then on the next slide, you can I want to talk a bit, little bit more about another. Uh, painting I have in the show, Rubens on my mind. And in the next slide, I, I also show um, some development shots, uh, process shots of the painting. So it started uh, with the idea of like having completely something different. Uh, I dyed that canvas into like just a yellow dye and um, I really couldn't figure it out. Uh, the composition, uh, the size of the painting didn't work for me and I was just Kind of struggling with what to capture in there but then i really like the just one part which i decided to leave on which has actually like i look at before as um as a symbol of the sun or like something warm um covering you um from above um but then you know things were changing i was covering everything in white just so, uh, like layering things but still leaving that that part there. And then on the next image um, slide, I start thinking of uh, all these creatures again, um, and then looking maybe at some Rubens sketches and seeing the parallel of those um, bodies, um, creatures coming from above, and then seeing it as a, as a way of um, getting it into my work. And then um, the next slide is um, it's just an example of how like a present moment and uh, observation of just trying to like work with an idea uh, and things that are happening in life can interact with the painting. So while I was making this piece, I had to go through like some monograms and then I got so many images of my um, breast that I, and I, I've never seen those images, you know, of my own body like that. But I was amazed how all those veins and uh, blood vessels are uh, interconnected, and all those like actually the painting I already started, like you know, just I I just decided to sort of probably show it in there, like all this interconnection layers of uh, snapshots of reality, and then. Um, it also made me thinking about a little bit about possibility of um, 
losing a part of your body and then um one of uh, part of your body not serving anymore any purpose and then i start thinking about women and breastfeeding and then um and then um like losing your identity uh, with losing the part of your body and that might be another reason for um uh, getting an idea of all those uh like angel like creatures going around that shape that after all start looking to me as a actual like a shape of the breast not the sun and another a little bit of um bit of uh imagery um as a color inspiration uh in another work of mine in the show uh, where you just see like the bright purple lighted in um in the grayish um less colorful surroundings that's actually like the first flowers i have seen uh this year uh so thank you this is it yeah that's done is next thank you and thank you sk for doing my slides can everyone hear me okay mm -hmm. okay um so my name is dana o'malley I live and work in Philadelphia, and I wanted to share a photo of the steps to my studio, which is actually where I am right now in the basement, <laughs> um, because I think it's a good snapshot of what my practice is about. Um, I'm really interested in how my art becomes part of my everyday life. Um, I'm interested in bringing sort of the mundane um, to a point where you can look at it and cherish it and spend time with it in some way. Um, so this is a view of the studios, the steps down to my basement studio. You see there's like clutter. Um, there's a potty training seat down there, rags, just all these things that are a part of my um, life right now. Um, all right, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. This is a piece that is in the show up at Heaven right now. Um, it is made with paper mache, which I layered over a wooden panel um, to shape it. Um, there's, and I let it dry outside, um, which is important to me to let the work sort of take on its own form and transform itself. Um, well, my hand is very much part of the work, getting dirty, the physicality, the touch of materials is so important to me. Um, at the same time, it's really important to me that the materials have a life of their own and that I don't control them too much. I had a professor um, in undergrad always say, let ink be ink. Um, and that's always stuck with me um what they were saying is just let let things be what they are you don't have to fight them um so my goal is to never fight materials but to let them expand and grow to their best ability and through that process there's failure right because our whole world is about often <laughs> in the society is about controlling things and making them behave or align or grow in a certain direction and I'm really trying to not do that in my studio practice um you can see the rain droplets that formed on this piece if you're zoom in or if you're in the, the studio um I let it dry outside on my porch in the rain um there's some canvas in there um there's an oatmeal container top just all this sort of clutter from my daily life I like to bring into my work and I'm thinking about time, piling, metaphor, um, quiet. I want them to feel quiet. My titles have gotten really long too. Um, all right, let's go to the next slide. So this is a process progress shot of one of the pieces that I have at Heaven Gallery right now. I thought I'd share it just to kind of see how 
um, this piece evolved. It's also paper mache um, with layers of glue on top to make it feel stronger or almost like wood. It feels kind of burnt, which I really enjoyed that. I'd say it's a little more manicured than some of my other work in the show, um, which is neither good nor bad, um, but just an observation. Um, I've been interested in still life. I'm one of those artists that's always looking at still life, but really can't paint a still life um, for the life of me. Um, I get bored, but I just love the poetry of still life. I love the quietness of still life. And I'm always looking at still life paintings. And I like that they say so much so quietly um, without peacocking. Um, and that's that's always been attractive to me. Um, the space in between things, the the dust bunnies um, between furniture, just the, the stuff that you don't really notice, but what is it saying? Um, there's an old t-shirt on this painting. Um, that's what's on the, the viewer's left side. Um, that's been stained and marked up with ink um, and acrylic paint. So this one changed quite a bit, um, but we'll see on the next slide. And it became sculptural. Um, I was really excited with how my work became more sculptural for this show. Um, and I feel like I'm on a new kick um, making this work. Uh, Sort of have a 3D life in a way. Um, with such a painting background, I'm a painter who doesn't really make paintings, so I'm glad I'm finally allowing myself to just move towards sculpture. Um, so this is the same piece and it's resting on a sort of like a backing. It's actually was something for curtains I got at a restore store where I go frequently if I can't find something just on my own. Um, it was like a little wooden rest of sorts um, that I'm using as a backing to sort of prop this up like a picture frame, um, sort of a portrait. Um, I like that it's tilted and irregular. Um, that comes back to these thoughts about failure or just letting something kind of be as it is. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect. It can be irregular. All right, we can go to the next slide. These are process shots of a piece that I had no idea where it's going and it ended up, I'm really happy with what happened with it. Um, these are parts of a piece that is in the show at Heaven Gallery as well, um, that ended up being piled and manipulated and sort of, I, I allowed them to weather. That's the word I like to use. I allow things to sort of gather, collect, dry up, cool, get muddy. Um, so these are made with paper mache, canvas, um, cardboard, scrap pieces of plank flooring um, that I have found, plastic. There's actually plastic bags in here. Um, and it's all piled up um, just like life does, right? Like these aspects of our daily life, all the the clutter, emotions, thoughts. Um, I, I like finding the poetry in, in this sort of mundane um, slide. We can go to the next one. You'll be able to see what this sort of became. You can kind of see snippets of those progress shots here. Um, I was happy with this piece. I call it my pile, pile piece, and I feel like it's a a route I'm going to keep taking um, in the future and get get larger. Like I want this to be huge now. Um, those are stalks from of cone flowers from my garden um, that I love. They they get dry in the winter, and I like how they're like these little skeletons that just sort of stay all winter um, and sort of fight through it. I think they're really beautiful. The title to this piece is Until We Find Out What We Will Do That Is A Little Bigger Than This. Um, 
I was just thinking about the want and the hopes and like the dreams and just sort of the way that we approach our everyday life and how we're always thinking for what's next, what's bigger, and just sort of like resting with the now um, and its beauty and its failure um, is important to me. Okay, slide. Um, this is another piece that I made. Um, it's actually in the Heaven Gallery show. Um, it is made with paper mache as well, um, as well as string and paper towel that's sort of been uh, compressed together um, to make sort of a sculptural substrate, substrate of shorts, sorts. Um, I also prop this up in the way a picture frame might be. You'd see like on a tabletop or a dresser top, um, those, the backing and the little piece uh, in front, oh, thanks for zooming in, SK, um, is foam. I'm sure everyone's probably seen this, those like, they're like foam puzzle pieces that a lot of like daycare centers use or folks use so that kids that are playing or learning to walk don't get banged up when they take a tumble. Um, so this is just a few of those that have been cut up and piled. Um, to form sort of this layered, soft, um, but hard fossil-like thing. Um, and I have I have an 18 month old at home. So a lot of my work revolves around, well, a lot of like the clutter in my house right now is like, is like that, like the stuff that like she throws on the ground and things. Um, but also just thinking about like how quickly things are going as a parent and how time is just like flying by and I just want to like hold it and cherish it. Um, the title of this piece is Flatter Me Skeleton Key. I'm just thinking about like keys to the future and the past. I have this habit of writing down little lines or poems or titles on my phone randomly throughout the day. And then I forget what I was thinking about half the time. Um, so all the titles in the show were things that I have written down in the past year or so um, randomly and then decided to kind of work with them and put them out in the world. I think that's my last slide, but we can check SK, I don't know. Um, that's my last one. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. I guess that means I'm up. Um, okay. Uh, I'm Jennifer Taswell Mobby. I'm based in Vancouver, Canada. Um, that's two hours north of Seattle with basically the same weather for anyone who uh, who might uh, might not have a sense of where that is. And um, as with the other artists, the themes and the ideas that we've put forward and gathered in the stretching now and um, uh, the idea of the long now is deeply relevant to my practice in some personal ways that I'll talk about today. Language, text, and storytelling is really important to me. So one of the things you might notice is I have a lot more text on my slides than my colleagues. And I also uh, might uh, talk a little bit more. I may speak more than, uh, than show pictures. <laughs> Some quick background. Um, I'm a Canadian with a British passport who is also an Australian with a Canadian accent. Um, and I, I bring that up not for humor, but because this globally dispersed and at times confusing and often invisible hybrid identity is one of the things that has not only shaped my life experience to date, but also shapes my art practice based on some fundamental questions and confusion around who I am, where do I come from, who do I come from, where is home, and what is my heritage and what have I inherited. Um, these questions have always driven an interest in me in genealogy, family history, cross-cultural similarities and differences. Um, and that in turn has led me to things such as um, being involved with and deeply interested in temporary and alternative community building. Um, and when I say alternative, I mean outside of the traditional family structure, 
Um, I've been separated from my extended family for most of my life. Um, and for example, um, ideas around uh, chosen family and uh, who we consider as our tribe. Um, I'm also deeply interested in comparative anthropology, um, archaeology. Um, I'm a museum kid. I always have been. Mythology and narratology. I did my undergraduate studies in classical studies, which secured a foundation in Greek or Roman history, art, architecture, uh, art, archaeology, and literature. Um, I looked to further challenge those traditions um, cross-culturally by looking to other parts of the globe. Um, which is also an aspect of how, uh, based on my nature, I'm always looking for commonalities between people and between cultures. I love science fiction. Um, for me, it's no different than other forms of fantastical ways that humans have sought to explain phenomena um, and uh, how we exist in the world and our experience of the world through story, song, and picture. I'm further obsessed with science fiction um, and in particular, how science fiction has been used as social commentary and critique in, for example, uh, the Russian Soviet era, um, and then also the magical realism uh, movement in Latin and South America. During times of social disparity and inequity, um, the intent of the literature and art of that time to draw attention to social conditions in order to critique the power structures uh, behind those conditions. For the rest of this uh, talk, I'm going to focus on four aspects that are fundamental to my work, uh, my practice, and my worldview. And those things are time and my relationship to time through my work, drawing as the spine of my practice, uh, non-linear narrative and storytelling, um, which is my immediate relationship to time in my studio, and then story worlds and how narrative and world building allows me to explore as an artist and make in a wandering way. And we can move on to the next slide. So in regards uh, to time, I wanted to talk about this work on the right hand side, which is in the show at Heaven Gallery, and um, the elliptical way that references and research before making the work, while making the work, and then after making the work have appeared. Um, I have always been interested in linking the ancient past to some kind of speculative future, um, and then back again to the present. And that's a fundamental way that um, I think and I operate in the world. I'm also concerned with what I would call, and I think what others call the ahistorical, which is a tendency, and it's quite a current tendency, to think that the past has nothing to teach us. Um, this, uh, focusing back again on, on this work and the relationship uh, to time, this elliptical behavior, um, some of the uh, some of the references and some of the meaning that I was able to um, take from the work um, was part of the intent going into the work, and some of it uh, came through post-rationalization. Um, like many artists, I don't realize what I've done until I've had a chance to reflect on it. Um, and I also uh, like and um, seek out uh, community um, with post-rationalization. I often need to hear from and solicit from my community, such as the P2P group here, um, what they see and um, glean from my work so that I can have an even clearer understanding of what the work is doing um, and, and what it is. Some of the references relevant to Weaving Our Web, which is a uh, one of the four large oil pastel drawings um, in the show. Um, the top left shows a Roman floor mosaic from Pompeii. The top right image is a Flemish tapestry from the 16th century. Bottom left is the uh, three fates from the Parthenon ma marbles of uh, ancient Greece. And this is actually one of the hotly contested um, marbles for uh, ownership currently in the British Museum. And then on the right is a screen grab um, of three of the Bene Gesserit uh, sisters um, in a similar um, uh, pose and situation um, from uh, David Lynch's epic sci-fi film, Dune. Um, I don't know if people are as obsessed with, uh, <laughs> obsessed with Dune as I am, but I've seen, I've seen all of the versions. <laughs> the, um, 
in the process, so in the process of making this image, it became clear that the three central figures um, had a relationship to this age-old motif of the three wise women, the three witches, the three muses, um, are, and the three fates. And um, the um, realizing the realizing the relationship and going back, going into reflection and into and in, and in, into making um, became became pivotal to the to, to the final version. Um, initially, there were only three figures in this work, um, and if you if you look closely, there are actually four figures in this work. There's a a fourth uh, figure, a fourth woman leaning into the central figure um, who shares her uh, who shares her arm and shares her hand. Um, and it was exciting to discover um, after the fact in this post rationalization reflection period that there was a correlation to the Flemish tapestry um, of the three fates um, with the, the third figure on the ground, uh, which is which is meant to re ref um, meant to represent uh, um, death. Um, the three fates, um, the Morai in ancient Greek religion and mythology, are actually three sisters. There's the spinner, the allotter, and um, um, Atropos, who is uh, the inevitable, which is a metaphor for death. Um, and I feel that that's um, really relevant um, for this work. Um, and the recognition of that, again, through the making and after the making um, made this work seem richer and was one of the reasons why I edited it um, for uh, for showing um, at Heaven. Um, another thing that's important to me is to look cross-culturally. And so um, it was uh, interesting to discover that the three fates appear in different cultures across the Indo-European tradition with very similar tales. Um, and for example, in Romanian um, culture, they're the Raznitsky, um, who are figures um, who foretell uh, the destiny of individuals when they go to go to ask them to tell them their fortunes. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, drawing is fundamental uh, to my practice. Um, the show, the the works that I'm showing. Um, at heaven um, are all drawings, all royal pastel drawings. And drawing also has a direct connection uh, to time for me. Um, I take an expanded definition of drawing. So drawing is the most immediate way uh, to get the idea out from the hand to the eye, um, from the brain to the hand to the eye to render an idea. And that means that um, drawing in my practice doesn't necessarily just look like pencil on paper. Um, anything that has um, the feeling of speed, um, the feeling of scribbling or scribbliness, um, anything that allows me to move in a fast, immediate, and vital way, um, I consider to be drawing. And also um, anything that allows me to use this similar mark across uh, various uh, mediums. Um, so um, for example, on the left-hand side, um, when preparing for this show um, last year, um, I made some um, finished uh, drawings uh, with a water, um, a water and pencil medium around mourning and masking. Um, I've thrown in an earlier sculpture um, where I have marked on the sculpture with drawing um, media, um, scribbling and, and, and marking. Um, and then in preparation for this show, um, and also uh, due to the importance that language and text and narrative has for me um, in conjunction with um, collaboration, um, I fed some of my early drawings and sketches into an AI engine and used text to image prompts to further uh, engineer those images um, and edit and refine and edit refine um, until I came up with um, a, a set um, that I then used uh, to move into uh, the physical making. Um, the bottom right hand image is a color study. Color studies are also some of the things uh, that I do um, that I consider part of my drawing practice um, in preparation um, and that I did in preparation for this show. Um, so drawing is sometimes the, the start of, of a work or the start um, of an idea, the start of a narrative journey. Sometimes it is um, what happens along the way to reflect, rely, uh, refine, problem solve, um, and uh, better understand what's happening in the moment. 
And then drawing can also be a reflection after the fact and in a literary sense, a, a pressy, which is some kind of summary um, or um, uh, summary or um, um, final um, reflection um, on, uh, on what has happened uh, in the work. Next slide. So the way time works in my studio is 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 also I think relevant to the theme in the discussion and um, the uh, the thread um, that each of our, us artists uh, work with um, ideas um, and I'm not the only artist who works this way I think that in my practice it's just forefronted and it's something that I consciously think of. Um, ideas and the life of the idea happens in an elliptical way. It's nonlinear. Um, the way I think about storytelling and the way I'm interested um, in storytelling is also elliptical and nonlinear. Um, if I was just interested in storytelling and narrative, then I would probably be a writer, uh, but I'm not. I'm a, I'm, I'm a visual artist. And so it's the the relationship and the tension between attempting to storytell in a visual way um, that uh, that I think conflates and confounds uh, confounds time. Um, another thing that I think about actively, um, and it probably comes from uh, my background before I started drawing and painting. Um, I was actually a photographer, and so I often think about the macro to the micro. Um, the photographic and the cinematic eye, um, both in my compositions and in the worlds that I'm that I'm building around the characters, and I'm going to talk about world building next. And so there's this um, notion of um, zooming in and pulling back with a camera lens um, in order to decide uh, what gets made into a painting or a drawing or even or even a sculpture. On the left hand side, I've roughly shown how. Um, with this uh, word graphic, the um, going from text um, and uh, prompt engineering in this case uh, works its way through. Um, there were some initial ideas, some initial sketches. I fed that into the AI engine using text and language. Um, and then after uh, many um, iterations and massaging and collaborating with that engine, uh, there was a, an, an, an image that came out that I, that I edited and, and, and held, held back to work further, which is uh, uh, on the bottom left there. I then did a color study. The color study, which is the watercolor, the third image from the left, is actually what then precipitated the large drawing that's in the show. And after the large drawing in the show, I circled back in this pricey matter, this summary um, and trying to understand the conclusion and also um, how um, summarizing the characters and the world and the situation could then um, seed in a way um, additional works and additional conversations and storylines going forward. And that's where the smaller uh, pastels um, shown here in the frames uh, came out of. So um, drawing and time and storytelling uh, does not work in a traditional linear um, manner um, in my studio or in my brain. Next slide. So story worlds. Um, are the way I describe the different bodies of work um, that um, seem to float up uh, in my studio. I have a hard time. Um, I have a hard time throwing out ideas that that feel vital. Yet I also realize that editing is incredibly important <laughs> for someone with uh, interests as vast and varied as I have. Um, and one of the ways I've come to understand. Um, my way of building narrative is through this idea of uh, story worlds and um, almost world building within a theme park. Um, so I found this 1978 map of uh, Disneyland in, in Anaheim. Um, and um, I often use uh, Westworld um, and that science fiction novel as a way to describe for people uh, how bodies of work uh, develop for me. Um, I don't like to abandon stories or ideas um, or characters once they've been invented. And so I think of them as um, worlds or um, places in the theme park that I can that I can return to anytime I want um, and keep uh, uh, keep keep developing and um, 
living um, and, and evolving um, those characters. Uh, fantasy literature is important to me. Um, it's one of the very first forms of human storytelling. It's fundamental to our nature, um, the way to respond to awe and our search for reason. Um, and in this way also, um, I believe I think like a filmmaker, um, characters often come to me first. Um, and then I think of environment, motivation, a situation, um, and uh, then the whole mise-en-scene. So the props, uh, the costumes, um, and uh, the way that... Um, the way that, uh, um, yeah, the way a filmmaker or even even something like a video game builder uh, might uh, might uh, create um, create the the, the world um, around around the making and through the making. Um, Kiki Smith is a favorite artist of mine, and um, something pivotal uh, for me in understanding my way of working and um, coming to coming to terms and being okay with uh, with my way of working was her describing um, a similar thing um, and a similar approach that she has is that uh, when she's making a body of work, she allows herself to imagine that the studio um, is a garden and she discovers what happens next in the story um, and in the garden um, one at a time and in what she describes as a wandering way. And next slide. And I just want to um, leave us here with uh, some of the, the details from the works in the show because the, uh, the drawings are quite big um, and unless you get your nose up really close to them. Um, all of the drawings are oil pastel on paper. Um, and again, in relationship to time, oil pastel is is what I reach for when I want to work quickly and when I want to work large and be athletic and when touch is important. Um, I'm constantly astonished by the luscious texture and the delicious colors of oil pastel um, and how oil pastel can provide those things with instant gratification. Um, so back to time, um, you don't have to wait for oil pastel to dry. Um, and um, finally, these works, um, um, and the way I work with oil pastel have been deeply touched. They've been rubbed and scratched into and touched over and over again. My fingernails were destroyed by the time I got to Chicago and uh, my knuckles were also swollen. Um, and I think that uh, touch and the comfort that comes with touch is highly relevant uh, to our need to be in community. Um, and one of the things that we give to, uh, to community and therefore relevant for the show. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, I just want to say really quickly, I am putting the link to the Long Now Foundation in the chat. Um, and I forgot to mention behind me, I have the Long Now Foundation's giant clock that they built <laughs> to keep time over the next 10,000 years. Wow. But it is, it's in a mountain somewhere. Um, and I just popped the uh, link in the chat for anyone who wants some follow-up info. Um, Alma, I'll pass it back to you and Jerry. I know you guys have events coming up in the gallery too, in case you want to mention those or anything else. I'll just mention that we're open for gallery hours right now. We already have people in here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're open Thursday through Saturday, one to six and Sunday, one to five. And now that it's extended a couple of days, definitely stop by and see the show. And thank you to all you artists for sharing, um, your inspiration and your process for this exhibition. There's so many people that have come in and really enjoyed the ex exhibition. Um, there's also like so many um, backdrops that you can take photos in, <laughs> which we have been taking full advantage of. <laughs> A very Instagrammable show, yeah. <laughs> accidentally. Yeah, so thank you. Awesome. Thank you, thank you so much. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks Thank you. Patricia. Bye, everyone. <laughs> <For coming. laughs> Take care.